Baruch Atah Adinoy Adinoy Mechelam Shehakol Nia Bidbarei Amen Amen Lachaim everybody Lachaim Lachaim Welcome everybody Far and near <laughs> so if you can give me the answer please in one word one word how do you feel about being chosen one word anybody Because everybody's working. Responsible. Responsible. Blessed. Okay. Anybody Grateful. else? Grateful. Grateful. Okay. Thank you. What else? Hmm? Loved. Okay. Good. Come in, ladies. It's a nice day, so everybody can start partying. Yes, that's where we are, right here, partying. <laughs> well, we finished our girls. <laughs> I mean, you know, I just finished yesterday in both shuls. I went to the other shul. I told you. You're being you're being heard around Sorry, the world right nice now. <laughs> <laughs> They're listening to you in Lima, Peru, and in Germany. You all missed a wonderful kiddush yesterday. A beautiful Shabbat. <laughs> and some from Montreal. <laughs> All right, make yourself at home, folks. Okay, very good. Well, some might have said arrogance, bigotry, chauvinism might be the word that would come up, right, for feeling chosen, right? Which was, of course, what justified the Nazis for their mass genocide oh. in the Second World War, right? Dehumanizing Jews and others, all in the name of um, being chosen, or at least self-chosen. So with that in mind, let us go to this week's Torah portion and to learn some unique ideas. Okay, you see on your screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now they can just hear you, but soon. <laughs> um, all right. A, a shahakol on it, on this. The sushi is shahako, unless you made it already on the uh, Amen. Enjoy. Shalom, Rabbi. You can move closer. You can move closer. Feels ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, in this week's Torah portion, Kisavai, the verse says to us, as he promised, God promised, God selected you. This is Moses, Moshe speaking. God selected you this day to be his treasured people and so that you will observe all his commandments. Okay, so the first part of the verse affirms that we are God's treasured people, right? Concept of chosenness, if you will. But the second half, he chooses us that we should observe his commandments. Right? You might think that when you get chosen, right, you become elite. And when you become elite, well, then others will do the service. Right? But nope, God says, I'm selecting you and I want you to fulfill 613 commandments. Right? Which uh, for some people, might be reminiscent of the famous uh, sense on Fiddler on the Roof when Tevye looks up to heaven and he says, I know that you have chosen us as your chosen people, God. 
but why couldn't you choose some others for a little while? <laughs> right? In other words, you chose us, we're treasured, and now you, you know, you want us to serve. And what are the terms of the contract? Well, it's not, uh, it, it's not haughtiness and chauvinism, right? <laughs> it's to be a servant. So the Talmud tells us a beautiful story. Chaim, Chaim first. Talmud tells us a beautiful story of uh, the Academy of Rebbe Gamaliel, one of the famous uh, leaders in the Academy. And he was informed that there were two great, brilliant young scholars um, that were impoverished and they needed, they needed some, you know, some help. So, you know what? We'll give him a paying position as the head of the academy, right? And um, you know what happened? They didn't come. Gave him a paying position. So in their humility, they didn't want to come. So he summoned them again, and they arrived. And he said to them, you think I'm appointing you to a position of mastery? It is a position of servitude to which I appoint you. Intuitively, what do we think when we have a leadership role? I'm in a place of mastery. I'm the leader. I'm the master. You're the servant, <laughs> right? You're here to serve me as the leader. Uh, they didn't want that. So they didn't come to him initially. But he said, you're making a mistake. Leadership isn't about lordship. Leadership is about service. By the way, it's probably something that we uh, could teach a few people in, in uh, so-called places of leadership, right? So chosenness is not a titled position. Chosenness for a Jew means that you're selected to serve. Okay, fine. What are we selected for? So that's what the verse says. To observe all the commandments. To, we're selected. We have to observe all the commandments. But in addition to the commandments comes along something else with the chosenness. And that we have in a... Previously in the book of Exodus, there it tells us, and now if you obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure, treasure out of all peoples, for the entire earth belongs to me. Then continues the verse, and you will be my kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So here's two conditions in the uh, chosenness of the Jews, Jewish people. First one is the one we learned already. We've got to obey the commandments, right? God commanded us 613. We have to obey them. But the second brings something else to the table, that we're a kingdom of priests, of princes, a holy nation. What does that mean? What does that mean? So a 16th century sage by the name of the Serfono, so the Serfono, the Serfono, he says as follows, you shall be my treasure because you will be my kingdom of priests. What does that mean? To teach and guide humanity, to invoke God's name, and to serve him as one. So Jews are not only a people on earth with a divine mandate to serve God, but also we have a larger mandate. And what is that? We have 613 commandments, and, they have, and the nations of the world have seven Noahide laws. And we are chosen as a kingdom of priests in order that we should be a role model to inspire others to teach them how to serve God. So we teach them about monotheism as opposed to paganism. We teach them about morality, a divine purpose rather than randomness and no purpose. And to teach them that they're endowed with a unique divine spark created in the image of God. And of course, the primary way we do it is by being a living example. And this is what Isaiah says, Yeshayahu Hanavi, the famous line that many people know, 
or Lagoyim that were allayed unto the nations, right? And, and we see that throughout the millennia that our influence in a secular society is nonetheless very much there, whether it comes to in God we trust, right? The concept of faith, the sanctity of life, the centrality of education, the prominence and the value of the nuclear family, and equality before the law. These are all just some of the simple things that um, we have inspired the world, which really didn't exist beforehand. You know, hard to believe, but we take it for granted today. So, and if you don't believe me, so, you know, <laughs> Jews always need to have non-Jews to, you know, to just bring out our point. <laughs> <laughs> um, Blair Pascal Blaise Pascal the Jewish people at once attracted my attention by the number of the wonderful and singular facts which appear about them this is written in the 1600s a French inventor mathematician a phys physicist uh, this family or people is the most ancient within human knowledge a fact which seems to me to be to inspire peculiar veneration for it especially in the view of our present inquiry. Since if God had from all time revealed himself to men, it is to these we must turn for the knowledge of the tradition. And here's another example. We have actually his book here um, in our library, Thomas Kale, who just, Kale, who just passed away this past year, an Irish American. So he writes, we are undeserving recipients of, of this history of the Jews. This long, excessive, miraculous development of ethical monotheism without which our ideas of equality and personalism are unlikely ever to have come into being and surely would never have matured in the way that they have. Unbelievers might wish to stop for a moment and consider how completely God... Oh. Is that there? One second. It was wrong page. You're on text. You missed text four, I think. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Okay, there it is. Sorry. Uh, unbelievers might wish to stop for a moment and consider how completely God, this Jewish God of justice and compassion, undergirds all our values, and that it is just possible that human effort without this God is doomed to certain failure. Humanity's most extravagant dreams are articulated by the Jewish prophets and Isaiah's vision. True faith is no longer con confined to one nation, but to all nations a stream to the house of God and that he teach, that he may teach us his way and that we may learn to beat our swords into plowshares. All right. So, you know, probably for most of us, that's self-evident, but, you know, Jews like to hear it from others. <laughs> By the way, we have his book over here, Thomas Cahill, somewhere over here. Got, uh, the Jew's Gift to the World. Um, so the question is, why doesn't our success get to our head? Why don't we feel superior? Why are we not discriminating against others and lording over the others, all other nations? So. The answer is pretty simple, that we were chosen to teach and to inspire. We were chosen <laughs> to be in roles of leadership and uh, direct others for our benefit. As the Sephorno explains, and you shall be my treasure out of all peoples. Humanity is more precious to me than all the lower creatures, because the purpose of creation is fulfilled through them. Indeed, our sage of blessed memory taught, beloved are humans, for they are created in God's image. Nevertheless, among them, you will be my primary treasure. So the Torah could have said, you will be my treasure, but it doesn't say that. The Torah says, you will be my treasure amongst all the nations, which indicates that the other nations are also a treasure. Right? How's that indicated? For in other place, how? 
It's created in the image of God, right? So therefore the other nations are. Our job is to find the divine gem in every human being and take that gem and polish it and make it into what it can be and what it it's meant to be, a divine treasure. That is our role. Therefore, there, it's not conducive, if that's our role, that we should feel elitist and superior in a manner that we will subjugate others because that's not what our role and what our task is. And we see that throughout history that that is the case. Is that clear? Any questions on that? Okay. All right. That was the simple stuff. <laughs> that was all what we already know. I didn't tell you anything you didn't know. Right, maybe put it into other words, but it's something that you're familiar with. Let's dig a little deeper. Okay, let's look a, a little deeper. So, there's something unique about the Jewish soul as opposed to the rest of creation and a non-Jewish soul. Do they know that we're considered the common treasure? They read the Bible, don't know it. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, that's what it means, a chosen nation, right? That, that concept they know. Yeah, I say they know that they're that were the chosen people. Huh? They keep trying to kill us. Maybe that's one of the reasons why. So they well, we'll we'll get into that maybe later. We'll get into that. We'll get into that maybe a bit later. Okay. Um, but the Jewish soul is something different than a human soul that is created in the image of God. And because it's created in the image of God, a human soul, what does that mean? There's sanctity to life. There's uniqueness and purpose, just like God is one and individual. So therefore, the stamp uh, of in each human being is unique and, and purposeful, as God is. Right? And therefore, capable of fulfilling whatever the mandate of that human being is to be a polished gem and to fulfill their purpose here on earth. But, it, but the Jewish soul is a piece of God himself. And that sets the Jewish soul different and unique. So a part of God rather than part of God's creation. The human soul is part of God's creation. The Jewish soul is a part of God himself, and he places that in us. Before he created the world, it was just God. Then he creates the world, he creates the world with everything that's in the world, including our bodies, including every, everybody else. And that is all part of creation. But before creation, it was already a, that God of God and that he put a piece of him into our soul okay so the value of that soul is then before creation has nothing to do with creation itself meaning once the world is created so the function of our role over here is what to be a light onto the nations. Our function is to be an example for the entire world, to change the world for good. That's the function we serve as a soul in the body as it comes down into this world, absolutely. But there's something of our 
soul that transcends creation. That's how Rashi explains it. That's... Oops, no. Here we go. Rashi. Treasure, a beloved treasure like the treasures of kings. As kings store costly vessels and precious stones in the secret treasure houses, so will be a treasure to me from among the nations. So Rashi is a, gives a little different nuance than the Sephardo. Rashi articulates a more profound chosenness. Sephardo says we're chosen to serve. That's our function. We're here to serve. We're here to serve through 613 commandments. We're here to serve not just the Jewish people. That's a primary service. Before even the Jewish people, you have a primary service to your own nuclear family, then your community, and extended family, then your community, then all of the Jewish people, and then all of humanity we have in service of, right? But Rashi speaks about being a part of God. So let's unpack what that means, right? So a king has a treasure vault. And for the most part, why does a king have a treasure vault? What does he use it for? Hmm? Well, that's where he keeps it. But what's the point of it? If he goes to war and he needs extra cash, he's got it there, right? If he wants to show off his glory, he's got the treasure vault that he can show his great power and his great glory, right? The the, the 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 precious gems that the queen will wear, they'll go on display sometimes, showing the great might and the glory of the king. Right? He has all of that at his disposal, all of the gems in that in that vault. Why? Because sometimes he might need it to boost the economy in some manner. He's got it all. Right? However. He also, in the metaphor, has gems and treasures that he just keeps there for his own sake. Not for the kingdom, but for its own pleasure. Not for anyone to see even, just for him. The, the kingdom doesn't get to see it. Now, we don't understand this idea because we don't know what a real king is, but, you know, a real king of, the, of, of yore had complete power and had complete control that, you know, they would do things to enhance the prestige of the king in the kingdom. But then there are the, the things that are not about prestige, not about his glory in the kingdom. It's not about his power. It's about something for himself. That is precious just to him. Let's see in the Rebbe's word from this week's Sicha. The king's hidden treasures don't enhance the kingdom. They are a part of the king himself. His kingship is tied to having hidden treasures of diamonds and gems to enjoy and to which to delight. This truly exalts the king. It elevates him intrinsically. So the Sephardo, when he speaks about our chosenness, what is his angle? God's prestige in the kingdom called this world. What's his prestige? Is that we're following in the light of God, in the ways of Hashem. We have 613 commandments. The nations of the world have seven commandments that everybody in the kingdom is serving so we have those who are at the helm who are responsible to make sure that there's those who are serving, just like the ministers of the kingdom, right? That's the Sephron. We are here to polish God's gems. Everybody is a creation of God in the, in the image of God. And that's our responsibility is to teach all of humanity, right? That they have a unique purpose, unique value. God needs them. He needs them that, to serve. So we're in service and we're to teach that to be in service, right? Rashi, though, is bringing a chosenness that enhances not God as and his kingdom, but God as king himself, for himself. It enhances him. 
as in the words of the Zohar, Yisrael umalke b'lechodoi, the Jewish people and their king alone. In other words, it's for God's sake, <laughs> not for, not for the kingdom. Special unto God, for the king. Now, who gets that? Anybody that's born as a Jew or anybody that converts. Because the conversion to being a Jew, according to Jewish law, you get a Jewish soul. And that Jewish soul is what we're talking about, right? So now, so what's the service though over here? According to Sephorno, the idea of chosenness is for God's kingdom. We're here to serve. You now, there's, there's a kingdom, there's a king, there's the ministers who have to administer the kingdom and have a responsibility. So Jewish people have a responsibility, to light onto the nations. They're here to, we're here to serve and to bring that notion of service to everybody. That makes sense. But according to Rashi's explanation, the question arises again. If, if I have a piece of God in me, and that's what just is precious to the king, it's his own personal treasure, what's the service over here? <laughs> what are we serving? <laughs> what's the function? You know, service is for servants, but that's not the point over here, right? That's the Sephorno's point, right? That the chosenness is for the sake of the kingdom. The king wants his kingdom to be a righteous kingdom. So he has people that have that role to make sure, and they're responsible. That's the Jewish people, right on to nations. Fine. But now we're explaining according to Rashi. According to Rashi, the chosenness isn't the function of the kingdom. It's the function of the king for himself. That there's something precious. As the metaphor, the king has great precious gems and wealth that he stores away in a vault. Some of it he displays for the sake of the kingdom. But there's some things that are just for him. Well, if that's the case, what does it mean to serve then? What is the notion of serving? Now, let the servant serve. <laughs> right? It's not. <laughs> is that clear? The question. Oh, okay. 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 So. On this level, it's not so much about serving as a servant, right, dutifully, but when you have that part of God, that you're a part of God, then there is no other reality but God on that level. So it's not out of servitude that you do. It's about a reflection of who you are in your authentic being. So on that level, the only reality is, on that level of the soul, there's only one reality. What's that? Godliness. So your devotion is for God's sake. Because it's for him. It's his treasure that he treasures. It's not for the function of accomplishing something it's for being something being your authentic self so you're connecting through the mitzvah for what purpose for the sake of god for the sake of the connection itself that's a very different notion and that's why it doesn't exist in the rest of the nations of the world because this is not a notion that is of the human condition the rest of the nation is a world created within the human condition, and the human condition dictates otherwise. Let's see from the words of the Rebbe. In this week's Sicha.
This is why our service is in a matter to, to observe all his commandments, as this week's Torah portion says, right? The Jews follow 613 commandments, not just seven Ochaid, as the seven Ochaids do. This is not just a quantitative difference, 613 to 7, right? Jews carry out a more, uh, more commandments and tasks. Rather, it's a qualitative difference. The observance of, of non-Jews is limited by the number of commandments and tasks that they are assigned. The observance of Jews who are one, as it were, with God's core and essence is beyond any measure or limitation. Since God and his will are one, a Jew who is one with God is devoted and committed to God's will. Let's, let's unpack that. What does that mean? So we asked, why should you serve? So it depends. The question is only, if there's another interest that you have in life, so then the question is, I have my interests, I have my focus in life, and now I need a reason to serve. Oh, I need to serve because I've got to bring this notion, got to be a living example for, the, for other people, right? Got to be light onto the nations. So that makes sense. But he, but here, the, the question is only because there is some other reality. There is some other thing in life. There's the things I want and the things what God wants. So I need to serve. So what do I do? I put aside what I want in order to fulfill what God wants. So God says, wake up in the morning, you know, go and pray, go and be a devoted. I would rather sleep or I'd rather be doing something else, but I do it. I do what God wants because I've got to serve because the human condition means there's a duality. There is me and what I want. And then there is what God wants. <laughs> and there'll be a conflict. I will always sense the conflict, right? Sometimes we end up doing what we want, and sometimes we do what God wants. But that's only because there's another reality in, called the world out there and me being a part of the world, which I am, right? Because I also have an animal soul. But from the perspective of the Jewish soul, it's different. The Jewish soul doesn't have any other interest but godliness, just goodness. For what purpose? For what purpose? For goodness sake, not to make the world a better place. That's a purpose. That's a means to an end. That's a means. It's a lofty. It's not wrong, right? It's not a wrong notion. That's a sephardo. Of course, we have, a, we have something to do here. We have something to accomplish here. It's a means to an end, to change the world. And I'll abide that everybody should realize that there's purpose. There's divine purpose that we all are endowed with, and we have to do what we have to do. But that is human, and that's everybody understands that. But on that level, there will always be a conflict. Because, yeah, I've got a purpose to fulfill, but, you know, hey, it's Sunday. And, you know... It's a nice day out there. There's other things too. Not just what God wants. Hey, I also have, I'm also something. On the level of the soul, of the Jewish soul, there is no other thing or other interest or other reality. All there is is what God wants and needs. So God rests on the, set, on, on the Shabbos. Oh, you know what? I'm also going to rest, <laughs> right? God wants this, then you just want that. Why? Just because. Not so you could be more fulfilled, not that you could be a better person, not you could get a great reward and go to heaven, you, you know, or you can, you know, have a better life. That's human. Everybody has that. And there's a reality. We, we all know about that. But we have a quality that it is literally just for the connection itself because we are connected intrinsically. And therefore, on that level, all there is is 
God, whatever you need, I'm there for you. Whatever it is. Because there is no other reality, there's no other allegiance to anything. And therefore, on that level, is there a sense of serving? Are you serving? You know what you are? You're being. You're living. You're being. Yeah, you're living. You're being yourself. You're not serving. Serving is work. Serving is work. On this level, it's not work anymore. You just are. That's a very deep part to tap into, of course, right? A very deep. So now what's going to happen when you tap into that part in you? Are you going to be elitist? Are you going to be uh, superior than others? So we have from the Sephornos explanation, you won't be because your task is there to serve for others. On this level, there is no, you're not, it's not about the service. It's not about being there for others, right? There's something superior about this level of the soul that doesn't exist, but it's not going to create an elitist superior complex that you will now be the Lord over others. Why not? Why won't it? Because when you come in contact with this, you're coming in contact with the, the God in you, right? When you stand before the God in you, right? The God beyond us, right? What does that in, do for you? One word. Humbles. Hmm? Humbles Humble. us. Humbles. Yeah, it humbles us, right? On this level that we're talking about, when we when we ex when we understand this and we sense this and experience this, right? It will be humbling, as opposed to you got promoted in your job, or you became a senior partner in your in, in the law firm. Or you got, you know, an authoritative authoritative position in the government, right? What does that do for you? Makes you bigger in your own esteem because you just got filled with something more in your life. That's the human condition that we all have an understanding of what that means. And of course, that's what it'll do for us. But when we're in calm, in contact with the true authentic Jewish soul within the Jew, that godliness that is a part of God. So then you stand and you stand before that and you're aware of that. That's totally humbling. Humility means that there's something greater than you. So when you have a vast glimpse, and we all experience this, and sometimes you know you go walk, walk out in nature, right? Walk out in nature and you see the vastness of nature and you recognize the vastness of God as creator. And we see and we feel our smallness. If you're an astronaut and you went out in outer space, right? You would see this little tiny world as a speck. And what would that create in us? A sense of humility. So when we stand before our very own soul that is a part of God and we sense its true nature and we sense it's not going to make us feel lofty and haughty and superior. Ultimately, what will it bring you to? To serve. But you'll serve in a much loftier way that it won't be just ball and chain because you have to. Right? The service will be not just because even you want to, but because this is you and your true intrinsic nature is just to be of service that's intrinsic to your being the servitude so it doesn't feel doesn't feel um you know often when we serve and you know we don't get back something we feel slighted we feel less than 
and we don't feel so giving anymore. But when you're doing it because it is the true nature of your nishama, your nishama is truly part of God, and it is a reflection of the divine, right? It is a reflection of the divine. So that means you're going to be giving. Why are you going to give? Just because you're a giver, because it's divine to give. Most from the human condition, we give because we expect something in return. Return could be, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. I did you a favor at work. You'll do me a favor at work one day when I need it, right? Or I did, did you know, I gave, I was charitable. It made me feel good. So I got something in return, right? I'm more honored in the community because I gave. So that makes me feel good. That's not, that's human. Everybody can do that. From the Jewish perspective of the Jewish soul, giving just because it's a divine quality. And, I, and therefore, that's an infinite form of giving because there's nothing that can ever stop that kind of giving. Just as God never stops giving. How do we know that he never stops giving? Yeah. because we exist exactly we exist out of god's kindness so he's giving every moment so for us that we are a part of that reality a part of it not a creation not not the not the recipient of it that's the difference to be the recipient of it you're grateful and you say thank you god give me more that's the human condition. It's God, I'm totally dependent on you. And therefore, I'm going to do these things. I know I'm dependent on you. I got to serve. Because if I don't serve, I'm not going to even be. Let alone the things I want to have in my life, right? But that's human. And we all have capacity for that. But that's not the Jewish soul. And that's not what we're talking about. That's not what it means, chosenness. Chosen is, is I give just because it's the godly thing to do, period. Very strong, period. No other reason. God's a giver, I'm a giver. God has empathy, I have empathy, period. Not for any purpose. That's his treasure. That doesn't exist in the world. That notion doesn't exist. It, because, there's, because the nature of this world is, what's the nature of this world? Material. Hmm? Material. It's material. Yeah. What else is it? The nature of this world, this na the nature of this world is cause and effect. Everything's cause and effect. So whatever you do, you know, there's an effect. Therefore, we always make a calculation. So everything is calculated, cause and effect. So if I'll do this, what will be the what will be the effect of it? If I don't do it, what will be the effect of it? That's human, and that's how we everybody lives. But that's not the Jewish soul, and that's not divine living, and that's not chosenness. Chosenness is I choose deliberately to do the act of kindness just because it's a godly way to be, period. Again, a period. What do you mean? Well, don't you have to calculate the, you know, the risk factor, what you're going to gain, what you're going to lose, and so on? No. I mean, yes. if the act of kindness is not appropriate, then yes, then you do. You know, to give to a, a drug addict, you know, money is not an act of kindness, right? It's not, a, that's not called an act of kindness. But if where it's appropriate and the right thing, the godly thing to do, so you do it just because it's the godly thing. That's what we're talking about. That's what it means, chosen people. That's what it means, the chosenness of the Jewish soul. Was this also because the reason that King Queen Esther um, saved the Jews 
and uh, she risked her life. Is this because she had a Jewish soul and had to do it? She, she knew the outcome could be her end, but she had to do it. It was yeah. That. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, this is this is the nature. And and it all comes out of a sense of humility, even in the giving. Do you feel that you're special because you gave? No, not if it's God inspired, not if it's God's soul inspired. You don't feel special. I'm just being me. I'm just being me. It's our default setting. It's it's a default setting of the godly soul. It's not the default setting on how we live. <laughs> We need to recognize this, to work on this, to make it the default setting on how we live. It's a default setting of our of our authentic reality. Absolutely correct. Yes, absolutely correct. What about um, if you feel um, if you feel grateful for being able to help or able to give? Is that, that that's good? But that's all human. That's not chosenness that we're talking about over here. If you are, uh, uh, you know, you're not human if you're not grateful. No, you're not I mean, you're if not you're human grateful. if you're not grateful. God gives you life and you're not grateful that that's not being human, yeah. right? Right, right, right. So, well, that's, so that's thank right, you. So that, yeah, we're talking about godly now. That's human. Godly means that I am giving not out of gratefulness. That's causing me to give. I, in other words, if I wasn't grateful, I wouldn't give. Because I'm grateful, so I'm giving. No, that's now, not what I meant, Rabbi. What did you that's mean? Not, I meant uh, you're, you're grateful to God to, for allowing you to be able to do this. Yeah, I mean, again, we need to do that. I, we need to be grateful. Yeah. I'm not, not, I'm yeah. not, I, I'm not uh, against that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be. Absolutely, we need to be. But the the point over here is a little more nuanced. Nuanced. Okay. It, it's it's not coming from gratefulness. It's coming from uh, a a reality that of authenticity. Of that there is nothing else but this truth. And what is that truth? I'm giving for God's sake. I'm giving for the connection. I'm giving to be, to reflect the divine that is my soul. And for that purpose alone. And that's oh, what's the truth to God. That's his treasure. Thank that's, you. His, that's his treasure that you're doing when, you, when you're doing it in that manner. Right? Thank you. Awesome. Are, so that's a, a, so Judy's asking a great question. Are we capable of this? We are because we have such a soul, yeah. but it, it it takes a lot of work to reveal that truth in us. So it's not a black and white issue or a black and white reality, even though the reality is black and white and in, in who and what we are, but living that is going to be, you know, shades of of gray shall we say lighter shades of gray so um yes we are we are and it comes to you know being choosing now deliberately that i'm going to let, let's say be give let's give the example of being giving in a in a in a circumstance where you're not getting something in return but it's the right thing to give and you still give and you do it, not ball and chain, because then that's serving. That's not being. That's not, that's your initiative. Which, by the way, if you did that ball and chain because you weren't getting anything back, you still do it. I'm not diminishing it. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. But that's not the chosenness and the treasure that we're speaking of. The treasure is that you will do it happily. You will do it with joy, even in spite of the person who is. Mm, right? 
true. Well, I, why? Why? Why would you do that? I mean, what are you getting out of this? Well, you, nothing. You're not doing it to get anything out of it. You're doing because this is the your neshama talking because this is the right thing. This is the godly way to be. Period. Period. True. That's that's the key. Period. <laughs> you know, it's hard to put a period because we. <laughs> but I mean, no, no buts, no ifs, and you know, again. You know, as the Alter Rebbe gives the in, in Tanya, he says, you know, you can imagine someone hurt you, said something nasty to you, and you still embrace them with full joy and love. Wow. Right? You're congregant in your you're congregant in your in your Chabad house was nasty to you, was like and you still embrace them as if they said nothing. Well, that's why the, that's the Rebbe's teachings. <laughs> that's the Chabad teachings. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm trying to I'm trying to help others that are uh, others in a certain situation, and they're uh, not embracing this because uh, we hear it. Yeah, we hear it. They don't want to because they don't want to embrace it. But but this is a truth that demands on us to look deeper inside of us and find the God in me and my neshama and to see how awesome that is and make that a reality, try to make that more of the true reality of who and what I am, of which, because it is who we are. Yes, Helen. Yes. Is that in a way, is that the same way as your good love it is it it, it 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 in a way it could be it right you're talking it's just spontaneous you don't think about it it's a spontaneous well i know no you have to no it's deliberate you have to be very deliberate in your choice for this okay so, no yeah very deliberate so very deliberate not out of sort of service but out of sheer love well oh, it, on that yes. level that's the love the soul has for god absolutely correct that's on that level. That's the love the soul has for God. What does love mean? Love means that you feel the bond. You feel the connection, right? Why? Yeah. Why? Just because you're bonded and you're connected. Just because, right? Just because you're bonded and connected, right? Just because, just like for you know, for your child, you feel a bond and a connection. Why? Because they did something for you today? Well, maybe they did nothing for you today. Maybe they even were abusive. And they said, you know, mom, you're like, you know, dad, you were today. Well, you know, <laughs> right. And you still feel the bond and the connection because there's a, that's the love that you have, right? Because they're a part of you. So we have a part of God in us. So when we can touch that place, then that, and we then, respond and do whatever it is that god needs from me and that's out of love so then it'll be right not the ball and chain it won't be the servitude right it will be because this is the nature of the soul that it just wants to be connected so why are you doing the kindness to be to be like god connected and that being like god is connected to him that's his treasure. And that's the treasure of the soul. That takes a lot of work. Yeah. Takes a lot of work. Yes, it and does. We've been working on this in TRC for a while now, and we continue working on it in TRC. Uh, Rabbi, yes. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, when a uh, Jewish Meshama passes on, does the God part of it go back to Hashem? Or? Goes back to its source, yeah. Okay. Goes back to, I mean, the trove of souls and eh, Gan Eden, Garden of Eden. Yeah. And if, if, if that soul is to be, if the, the belief is there, is to be reborn as a Goy, as a non Jewish person. It's, it's happened for different purposes on high for whatever reasons, but it can be. And, that, and that's why that person will end up converting. That's why that person will end up converting because they've been given a Jewish soul that is, you know, the potential of it to be realized through conversion. Yeah. Helen. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of the uh, Rosh Hashanah service. I think it's the Rosh Hashanah. And there's that song that we sing, Our Father, Our King. 
Right. I mean, the volcano. And in the end, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say that it, it's a dichotomy. Who, who's winning? You know, is it the father or is it the king? But it, you know, I've always, uh, I've always understood it's the father in that spot. So our, our father is, so it's interesting. Our father is the intrinsic connection that we have, right? As a child of, right? And our king is about the servitude. So we need both components, right? We need the Sephorno and we need Rashi in the explanation of this week's Parsha. We need the servitude because it needs to express itself in actually that we are in service of. Now, in that service, could be prompted by the neshama and the gloriousness of the neshama that it wants to be bound up and, and be, you know, and be giving as God is giving. So, you know, God rests on Shabbos, I rest, just as a reflection of who he is. But we're not always going to be on that level. So at least bottom line, we got to serve. We got to serve, even if we're not feeling it. Even if we're not there, we don't have the love. So what, where are we left? Serve. That's what the Sephardim said, right? That's, that's what it means. It means in service of. God has a kingdom over here. He wants it to be. He has a garden. He wants in that, that garden. It needs to be taken care of. So we're here to take care of it. We're responsible for it. So that's the, the minimal level that we have to for sure always never forget, right? Because we're not going to live by this higher. The, the higher level that we're talking about of the chosenness, we always need to know that that's the truth, even if I'm not living it. <laughs> even if I'm not there. No, 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 you are it. No, you are it because it's your neshama. That's yeah. the point of it. It's your neshama, and that's what's key over no, here. But the fact the fact is, it's my neshama. But my neshama is in a body that the body has a different agenda than the neshama. The body has agenda of me, myself, and I looking out for number one and not a capital O. You know, not a capital O number one, not <laughs> but me number one. That's what the body is all about, and and we know of that. So that's the struggle that we have. So none the, the bottom line, serve. You got to serve. That's what we're here for, right? At the same time, recognize that there's something more lofty and divine that we can make that service that is about the connection, about the, the lofty bond that the soul has and that we do it just because of the divine nature that we have. Also, because he's our father, and that's what he's doing. Right. Uh, he loves us so much. We're part of that. Absolutely. Right. But I'm saying, too, that we constantly live there is not so simple. That's why he is our father and he is our king, both, qual right? He's the king of the kingdom that has a function that we need to fulfill in his kingdom, right? The Sephardim, the first explanation that we get, we have that we are here to serve, and that service is a struggle because we have our own agenda that we need to struggle with to in order to fulfill what Hashem wants and needs from us, right? So we need to know both things. <laughs> both are true. Both are a reality, but that first reality, we all knew and we all experienced that. But this higher reality is something that we need to be more aware of and cognitive and meditate upon it and try to incorporate it and make it more real for us. All right, folks, any, any questions online? So far, so good. <laughs> God bless you. All right, Thank folks. You. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very God much. Bless. God bless you. Have a blessed weekend. Week.